Today's message I want to get into, y'all, what the Lord had put on my heart, was um, I, want to, uh, I want to read to you guys um, the concern of uh, some dying men in the Bible. That's, uh, and this is from 2 Peter. And what I'm talking about is um, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, Peter says... Um, this is right before he dies. He says, Knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So, what I want to get into is I want to tell you about, I want to get into Peter, and I want to get into Paul, and I want to see what it is that they want to talk about right before they die. Because here it is. This is the most important message. Um... Good job, Z. This is the most important message that you and I could, um, can take, you know, uh, for the church. In fact, I even wrote, um, the only song that Jay sang was, uh, I will walk by faith. I will walk by faith, even if I can't see. Uh, so anyway, Z, if you can just bring it up, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to read... I hope you have your Bibles. If you do, open it up to 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read and um, really kind of open this thing up to you, open this up to you so you can see uh, and understand the most important thing, you know, right before somebody dies or right before we see Peter or Paul die, they want to talk about some things. They want to, you know, list their concerns. And um, I would take this as probably the most important thing, you know, that's, that's being said. So um, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just uh, we lift up your word to you, Father. And Lord, I just ask, Lord, as we begin to read your word, Father, that you would open our eyes to see and ears to hear. And, and um, Lord, I just ask that your spirit would move over us, Lord, and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So let me just kind of give you a background real quick of Peter. Peter was the one that God gave the keys to to open up um, the word to uh, the Jews first. He had the key. He, you know, he was the first one that stood up and preached the gospel. And God added to his church on the day of Pentecost about 3,000. Um, and then also he was given the key, remember, when he was on the house of Simon the Tanner. And Cornelius, uh, a man of giving, you know, uh, God recognized that. And he told Peter that, you know, um, the house of Cornelius, some servants of Cornelius, is, you know, coming to the house. You know the, 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 uh, the story. He's up on Simon Tanner, the, uh, the house, and the sheets let down. He sees all the unclean animals. He tells Peter, kill and eat. This was the engrafting in the Gentiles. So when they came there, you know, God said, go with them. And this is the key that Peter uses to open up now the gospel to the Gentiles, to the house of Cornelius. So he's the one that, you know, that actually uh, institutes everything and gets it started that, Pete, that uh, Jesus gave him the key to do. So um, the thrust here in 2 Peter is... First um, Peter, his letter that he, spe he that he starts in in First Peter, if you don't know, this is on the day of Pentecost when all of these people are engrafted into the church. Um, you don't have to turn there, but in First Peter you'll see that his first letter is addressed to those guys that he had actually ministered to. And 3,000 was saved. And it says, and that's why he starts out his letter. 
He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithna, and the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. If you read this right here, you'll find out, if you go to Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter 1, you'll see the same thing. To the strangers that are scattered out, in fact, I'm going to read it to you really quick. Um, so you'll keep in context the letter of which uh, 1 Peter is the beginning of his ministry. He's writing this letter to these that are in Acts that were just saved, added to the faith. And you can see that in, um, in, second, in Acts chapter 2. Um, down in verse 5 it says and there were dwelling in Jerusalem men devout men out of every nation and if you go down you'll see Galatians and uh, uh, Cappadocia and strangers of Rome and he lists these guys so the first letter that Peter writes the first letter of Peter is to these that was that was added to the church on the day of Pentecost so this is the beginning of the church age you could say 1 Peter chapter 1. In fact, if you look in chapter 1 verse 14 or 12, it says that um, through the gift of tongues, the gospel was preached unto them through the Holy Spirit. So this first letter is going to them. Now we see um, 2 Peter. And 2 Peter is, we find out that this is the end of Peter's life. So he wrote a letter in the beginning, and now he's writing a letter at the end. And we're going to see the concerns of Peter, of what's going on. So 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start reading. He says, um, now remember, this is a letter coming from a dying man. Very important. This is a letter from a dying man who's about to die. He says, um, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith wish with us, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. So grace and peace is multiplied unto us. How? Through the knowledge of God, knowing His Word, and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. According as His divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that he hath called us to glory and virtue remember God has called us to a holy life there ain't no you know dabbling in the world remember this is a letter from a dying man okay he says um, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust wow. and beside this given all diligence add to your faith virtue man that's righteousness be virtuous and to your virtue knowledge so not only add, you know, uh, to be virtuous, but add to it knowledge, learn the word. And to knowledge, temperance, which is self-control. And to temperance, endurance. And to patience, be godly. For if these things be in you and abound, they, they, may, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful. So if you're being virtuous and righteous and holy like the Lord is, it means that you'll produce fruit. You will bring others into the kingdom. Um, and he says uh, that ye shall uh, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you need to know the word, right? But he that lacketh these things is blind. So if you're not in your word reading and studying, you're blind and you cannot see afar off. You can't see the things that are coming. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That means if you're not in your word and you're not washing in the word, you know, you're going to wind up going back to the things you was doing before. Right? That means you forgot the word. It's not in you. It's not renewed in you every day. 
Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling an election. Sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall, stumble. For so, in, uh, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly and to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will, not, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you knew them, and be established in you in this present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, sir, so to stir you up by the putting you into remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So here comes the logistics of the message. He's about to die. So these are the last things that Peter wants to tell you and me right before he dies. He's crucified upside down. This is what he wants to say to us. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in your remembrance. Remember what I'm about to tell you, he's saying. For we have not followed cunning, uh, cunningly devised fables when we were made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. That's the mount of transfiguration. That's where God said, this is my beloved son. Uh, uh, hear ye him. We have also uh, a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that ye should take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is any uh, private in, uh, interpretation. Um, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they was moved by the Holy Ghost. But there were false prophets also among the people. So here he is. He's going to warn you and me on his deathbed what we need to be aware of in the end times. Okay? But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their, uh, their evil their evil ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be spoken of. Listen to this. And many shall follow their evil ways by reason because of them that shall speak truth or uh, evil. Um, let me start over. Father, in Jesus' name, help me, Lord. Put your words in my mouth. Through your spirit, Father, and let me speak plainly to the people in Jesus' name. We start over in chapter 2. But there were false prophets also uh, among the people, even as there shall be false prophets and teachers among you in the last days, who shall privily shall bring in damnable heresies. These are uh, heresies that will lead us away from what God has taught us, like uh, grace that, you know, is uh, greasy grace, saying that you can have the world and and you know live in the uh, in the scripture and live with with Christ. It says, "Who probably shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord had bought them, and bring unto themselves a swift destruction. And many shall follow their evil ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of." Meaning, they're going to speak evil of the truth in the last days. Um, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Now I want, you to, I, want to rem, I want to remind you of something. 
These are people, these are false teachers. These are false pastors. These are false prophets that he's talking about right here. He's talking about those that are going to try to come into the church and deceive you in the last days. And what they want to do is make merchandise of you. Okay? He says, um, And through covetousness, that means greed, shall they with feign words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and he spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with the overthrow, making them an example unto those that should live uh, ungodly. And he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and in hearing, he vexed his soul, his righteous soul, from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be uh, punished. But chiefly, talking about false teachers now, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now he's not, he's talking about the government that God had set up right there. The apostles, the prophets that was going out. These guys had slipped into the church and now are talking evil of not only the disciples, but of, you know, Paul and the apostles and all of them that are there. They're claiming to be something that they're not. It says, Whereas the angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not a railing accusation against them before the Lord. So listen to this. Even the angels don't talk bad about them. So how much more are we to guard our tongue? But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they don't understand and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Remember, these are false teachers and pastors that are in the church. Uh, and they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. He says, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. And these are, we see it all over TV now today. They're more concerned about making merchandise of you, about getting your money and taking what they have, what you have, and, you know, they sport around in big planes and cars and, you know, outfits, and they've gone after the lust of the world, which is the greed, which is money. Remember, this is Peter's dying words. This is what he's saying is going to happen right before the end comes. And he's telling you and me, he's warning us of these things that are coming. And the only way you're going to understand, you know, is to know your word so you're not entrapped into their carnality. Amen. And believe in what it is that they're preaching. Amen. And sending money to these guys. And, you know... Give me this, and I'll send you a vial of healing water. And send me that, and I'm going to give you an, an apron that we've prayed on. And sow a seed now for a thousand dollars, and and God's going to bless you a hundredfold. That's what's in the church. Deception. He says, having eyes, they are having eyes. Verse 14, full of adultery. And that cannot cease from sin. One of the biggest things that are in the church today is not only adultery and fornication, but homosexuality. Amen. It's running rampant in the church. And the pastors are the ones that are doing it. Amen. 
He says, having eyes full of adultery and that, and that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling, unstable souls. They're beguiling weak souls. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices. They're accursed children. All they want, they want money. They want things. They want to drain you of everything you got. And God is warning us of these kind of false teachers, false prophets that slipped in to the church and saying everything's going to be okay. Judgment is not coming. Amen. But clearly Peter is talking about judgment is coming because they are a sign that judgment is coming Amen. when they're in the house. It says, um, which have forsaken the right way. What does that mean? They was in the right way. Verse 15, and they have gone astray, following the way of Balaam. Balaam prophesied for money. Why is it today, can you take, let me, let me just tell you this, can you take the prosperity gospel and preach it in Africa? Can you tell the people that are in bondage and slavery and, you know, and is begging for food every day and tell them, sow your best seed and God is going to bless you? Come on. Amen. What are, you gonna, what are they going to sow? Why does that gospel only, you know, uh, attain here, work here? Because it's a false gospel. That's right. And the only thing they have in mind is to take what it is that you have. Are they ever giving you anything? Can you write into them and say, hey, my bills need to be paid and I'm about to lose my house. Can you send me money? Uh, no, you can't. In fact, you'll be lucky if you can even get up close to them because they got bodyguards around them. That's how it is now. Amen. That's the reality of, you know, uh, of the world's mentality of so-called the church. Yeah. Even not only, you know, not only uh, the, the non-denominational, or also the denominational churches. Even Rome. They're the richest church that's, you know, everywhere. Amen. They got it all. But yet, they want money from their parishioners. To do what? Is it to seek and save that which is lost? Is it to help those that are afflicted? When you wear a $15,000 a $15, Gucci suit and drive a $65 million plane, yeah. you know, because you think you need it around the world. Come on. You have lost it, and you don't even know who your sheep are. That's right. Amen. Exactly. What is a shepherd who doesn't know his sheep? Amen. How can a shepherd know 5,000 sheep? How can he? That's why when the Lord fed the 5,000, he said, sit them down in tens, fifties, and a hundred. So you'll know them. Come on. I mean, if, if 5,000 people's in here, how will I know if Joe's not here if I don't know him? Amen. Come on, brother. How will I know what my sheep needs or God's sheep needs if I don't know him on a personal level? But the mentality of the church today and the false teachers is grow a big church, right? Have a, a, an awesome children's ministry. Have the best praise and worship team you possibly can have. Offer food to them. Offer, you know, comfort. Put them in seats that they can, you know, be comfortable. Don't preach more than 45 minutes or you'll lose the congregation. And only preach things to them that's going to, uh, you know, tickle their ears and make them feel better. Don't preach against sin. Amen. That's the mentality, the true mentality of the church today. Amen. Amen. That's it. And that's what Peter and Paul, you're going to see, is warning you and me about. Man, listen, there's going to be pastors that bring in damnable heresies. Some even denying that Jesus is the Christ. And there's going to be people that follow it. 
Wow. That's pretty crazy when you don't even know your word and you can't, you know, uh, discern whether this one is a false teacher or not. Come on, brother. But if you know your word, you'll be able to pick them out. Let me keep going. Come on. He says, um, 15, which have forsaken the right way, meaning when they started off, they had a pure heart. But later, you know, now send me money. They went in the way of Balaam, and they prophesy for money. Amen. Wow. You know what that means? Try to get... Try to get any big name preacher you know on TV to come right here in this church. You know they have a minimum? They have a minimum to come. Some of them 50,000. Some of them 100. Unbelievable. And some of them would not even come here and, and talk to a few people like you. Right. That's right. In the arena. Buy tickets to come and see. But if he is a man of God who has all kind of money, I mean, listen, that's not the men of God. Amen. The men of God are the ones that, like Jesus said, when John came to you, did he come to you in, in, in garments and, and clothing that was, you know, purple and lavish and all that? No. He came to you, you know, in, in skins. You know, he ate locusts and wild honey. Amen. And money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Amen. And he says... And this is what the Lord is, this is, listen, this is what Peter is saying right here in verse 15. He is, whole, he is about to die. He's about to die. And he wants to tell you one thing. Man, don't be tricked by him. Because when you start giving to him, you start supporting him, you start believing him. Amen. You start believing like things like your best life now. I'm sorry. <coughs> your life now is supposed to be dead. So that Christ can live through you. It's not your best life now. And there's multitudes of them that are out there. And I'm not mentioning any names. But listen. He says, Which have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar. Wow. You know, Bosar means light. Light? Light. Wow. That is almost like Luciferian. Lucifer, don't you know that they'll come and they shall come and masquerade as children of light? Wow. Balaam was a soothsayer. A Gentile soothsayer. He says, um, verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages, the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. If you know anything about that, the angel of the Lord that stood before Balaam, it was Jesus Christ holding the sword. That's right. That's right. It was Jesus. You can go back and read that in Numbers, Numbers 22. When you read down and scroll, you'll see the, uh, before he goes, God tells Balaam, only speak the words that I tell you. And he left. And then the angel of the Lord appeared because he knew it was in his heart. And the angel of the Lord would have smote him with a sword and killed him. Right? And then when his eyes were opened, you know, he saw the angel. The angel of the Lord said he fell on his face and worshipped him. If he was a regular angel, the angel would have said, get up. And then the angel declared... What's that? It's the verse against me. That's right. He says, uh, um, 
he tells them, he says, oh, you only speak the words that I put in your mouth. Amen. That was God. Remember Joshua crossed the Jordan? And when Joshua crossed over, the angel of the Lord had a sword? Well, here he is again. He appeared with the sword. That's right. Right? Because God knew what was in the heart of Balaam. Balaam wanted money. So, yeah, I'll go over there and do what you say. But, uh, listen, uh, I'm going to prophesy good things. I can only say what the Lord says, but then he goes off in the corner to Balak and he says, listen, you know, I know you called me to curse the children of Israel. You know, why? Because he wants all of the stuff that, that Balak's offering him, all the gold and the silver. He says, you know, so that basically he can get this money. He says, look, if you want God's hand to be against him, you know, put those women, the pretty women out there in the front and have them commit fornication and God's hand would turn against them. Wow. So even a false prophet knows how God's hand would be turned against you if you fornicate, commit adultery and idolatry. Wow, God's hand will be turned against you. But yet, the preachers today say, you know, you can have the grace of God. And look, you can divorce your husband and wives. And hey, it's okay because God will forgive you. It's, it's okay. And oh, but the pastor said it was okay. I, I can do this or do that. As long as you've given them what it is that they want, they'll tell you whatever it is that you want. In fact, in, in another religion, you know, if you uh, got a divorce, they won't remarry you unless you pay a fee of like two grand. What is that? Money. Verse 18. Um, I mean, verse 17. He says, these are wells without water. A well with no water. Wow, what good is that? How can you drink from a well with no water? Clouds that are carried with a tempest. Clouds that are carried. These ones go all over the world. These wells go all over with no water. And you know what they want you to do? They want you to cash your money in their well. Wow, cast some money in my well. Ain't that something? It says, to whom uh, the midst of darkness is reserved forever. And another uh, part, it says, the, the worst part of hell is reserved for them. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, pride, they allure through the lusts, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. How do they allure you through the lust of the flesh? They tell you so, and God's going to bless you so that you can get. They're playing off of the lust of the people's flesh. So, and God's going to give you a big house. Just give me a thousand first. Amen. So they're playing off of what's inside of you. Amen. Not you and others. Why are they there? You know, toss me a blessing. It says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. So there they clean and they escape the, the things of the world and there they slipping back into the error of wanting again what the world wants. Like the children of Israel. Let us go back to Egypt. While they promise them liberty, liberty is freedom. Oh, you saved. It's all good. It says, um, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. That's the things of the world. They're servants of the things of the world that corrupt houses and cars and money and women and silver and gold and pleasure and drunkenness. And it says, For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. That scripture right there in verse 19, when I read it for the first time, years and years, I'm talking years and years ago, 15 years ago or more, the Lord told me, that scripture right there hit me so hard. And the Lord told me, you know, uh, beware. Because, you know, um, the one that I was overcome by was Jesus Christ. That's who I was overcome by. 
And if you don't know the Word of God, you'll be overcome by someone that you think is promising you liberty and salvation and freedom. And the whole time, you're on your way to hell. Watch. It says, by the same he's brought into bondage. For if, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome, and the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it had been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness, than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed in her wallowing, she's went back to the mire. And then he says, chapter 3, this is the second letter, beloved, I write unto you, in both which I want to stir you up to, uh, with pure minds by the way of remembrance, that ye be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us as apostles of the Lord, Je of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. This is false teachers. That's what he's talking about. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in water. Whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. He's putting them in remembrance of something that had happened. But the heavens and the earth, which were now by the same, were kept, were well, the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. He says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not con uh, slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Listen, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in a night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. I'm going to tell you something, and I believe this with everything in me. The pre-tribulational rapture is a false doctrine. It's a false doctrine. It's to teach you that the great escape is coming. And here, plainly, Peter tells you. He says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fer fervent heat. The er earth also and all the works that are in shall be burned up. Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved. It's okay. He's all right. He says... He says, seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are ye ought to be in? He says, in all holy conversation, that's living, and in godliness, looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of the Lord God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found in him peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as the beloved Paul also according to his wisdom, has given unto, uh, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, they wrestle as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. He says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, beware, lest ye also being led away 
with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him uh, both be glory uh, forever. Uh, amen. I'm not going to get into, uh, Paul also talks about it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Um, in, in, chat, in 2 Timothy 4, 6, he says, For I'm now ready uh, to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. And what he wants to talk about is, he wants to talk about the false teachers that are going to enter the church in the last days and say that you don't have to live holy anymore. And say that, you know, you can have the things of the world. And say that, you know, um, everything's good. But they're not good. Amen. And they're just going to lead you astray. And, um, you know, it's pretty amazing. I have a whole lot to say, but I feel like the Lord, you know, just wanted me to, uh, to stop. What's telling me to play? <laughs> you know, and I think the biggest thing is this, is that uh, we get the warning from, from Peter and Paul, who's about to die. And the, the message of that heart is warning about the false teachers that's going to come in in the last day. And um, make merchandise of the sheep. And, um, and lead people astray by a false doctrine by a grace that is uh, where you don't have to live a holy life, you know, where, you know, um, it's so one-sided that it's, it's a false teaching. And, um, golly, Lord. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you was that right now, what the Lord had spoken to me was that um, the times are about to get rough and tough and but the Bible talks about the early rain and the latter rain and what God has got me preparing for right now is just as we've seen the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in, in the former time when Rome was in power you know and the Christians on the day of Pentecost were seeing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They was all in one accord in the upper room. We've seen the early rain outpouring. and we've seen the in gathering. So you got an in gathering in the former and you got an in gathering in the latter. And what's going to happen in the end times? Where we at right now? We're about to see. You know, yeah, a lot of things is going to go down. A lot of people is going to be afraid for fearful sights and the things that are coming upon the earth. In fact, I just saw Chuck Norris in, in Texas is now speaking out and he said he's telling the, the, the Texans to take up arms and fight to your dying breath because of what's happening. He said the government is taking over and, um, and he's a Christian man. And I'm not telling you to take up arms and fight. That ain't what I'm talking about. I'm more concerned about the spiritual end gathering that's going to come in the end time. Because this is going to be the greatest opportunity for you and I to be a witness for Jesus Christ uh, than ever before. And I believe that if we use wisdom right now, we have the potential of feeding people, of preparing right now your heart and your soul and your mind. The Bible says establish your mind, you know, uh, in those days. Settle it in your heart that these things are coming. And, 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 and in fact, in Luke chapter 21, he actually says it. The things that are going to... In fact, let me read that real quick. This is what he says. But establish it in your heart because God is going to turn it into a, uh, an opportunity so that you and I... You don't want to appear before Jesus Christ unfruitful with no fruit. Man, you ain't got no fruit on your tree, you're in trouble. You know, it's almost like, you know, in Israel's time, if a woman was barren, man, they pleaded before the Lord day and night, man, to be able to give birth. 
That is our ministry Come on. to produce fruit for the kingdom. On, because when we get before our Savior, the one who imparts seed into you and me, what He gives us, we're supposed to give the world. But it's kind of opposite. The false teachers get up there and they say, give me. When they're supposed to be giving them. Amen. Right? Does the, does the sheep feed the shepherd every morning? Or does the shepherd feed the sheep? Because I'm really confused about this whole deal. I got up this morning and had to, you know, take care of the hose down the pens and take care of the, the poop and all the stuff that, the, you know, the goats and sheep leave. You got to take care of that. And there's a giving and a taking. There's a, a, a back and forth in it. But it's, it's not more sheep given to the shepherd. It's more shepherd given to the sheep. That's right. And pouring out into the sheep the things that they're going to need to survive. Like I'm getting ready to leave to go on, on a trip. And I'm already making provision for my sheep. So that they're fed when I go. And my goats at home. And that's what Paul and Timothy was doing. Listen, I'm about to depart. And I know once I go that there's going to be shepherds and false teachers that's going to come in and lie to you and make merchandise of you and say that you can have this and you can have that. And they're going to lead you off the path that I directed you on. Amen. But stay true to the path. How do you do that? Through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, through the Word of God, so that you could pick out a wolf amongst a sheep. Amen. Because they're in sheep's clothing. And I thought it was really crazy amazing. My son came up to me uh, the other day and said, Hey, Dad, you know, I uh, went to feed the snake, the king snake, and he wouldn't eat. And you guys know the message that I taught, how Lucifer entered into a dragon. It's the word, you know, teninin. And it's called a serpent. It was a dragon. He entered into a skin, right? Even Jesus Christ, God the Father, sent his son, which in entered into a skin. Well, when my son came up to me, you know, and said, Hey, Dad, you know, um, the king's not eating. He's shedding his skin. Wow. The serpent sheds his skin. You think about that. Jesus Christ, when he died, had to shed his skin. Right? You and I are going to shed this skin because we have a new skin tent coming that's laid up in store. Where the hope of the world, they don't have that. They don't have a new tabernacle. Like Peter said, I must put off this tabernacle so that he could put on a new one. But I thought it was kind of crazy because Satan entered into a serpent and it just so happened, happens that a serpent, a snake, sheds its skin. Wow. Are you with me on that? Come on. Is it by any coincidence that snakes shed? In Luke 21 it says... Jesus, here he is, he's about to die. I told you about Peter and I told you about Paul, right? And this is what Jesus says. This is, uh, this is, he just rode into Jerusalem, he's sitting on the Mount of Olives. Four days later, he's going to die. So here's the word of a dying man again. And this is how he starts it. He says, and he said, Jesus said, Luke 21, verse 8, And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not after them. Jesus is about to die. And what is he warning about? False teachers. Peter's dying. Beware of false teachers. Paul's dying. Beware of false teachers. He says, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in various places. Man, that is happening all over the place right now. Right? And then he says, In famines. Famine is coming, if you don't know it. Famine is coming. Put food away. Because I believe food, put food away now. We can have one of the greatest soup can ministries 
then you know what a testimony in the end time that this church can have that in the midst of everything breaking loose and everything going on that there's food in the house of God even if it's you know broth with, with rice people are getting fed and if you meet the needs of people if you meet the needs of people in their flesh they'll receive from you spiritually and let me tell you something that latter rain is coming that is going to be one of the greatest end time revivals of all time and can you imagine if you have food, what that's going to do for you, the ability that it's going to open up for you to be able to minister to people. You know the power that you're going to hold in your hand? Wow. You can bucket rice and put rice on a side. Rice will stay in buckets for years. And rice is, you know what, $17 for 50 pounds. Do you know you can live off a serving of rice in the morning and in the evening? Wow! Can you imagine a big pot? Can you imagine a big pot of rice this big? And if we just got one chicken and throw them in that pot, whole! Amen. And let him cook down and get that, that chicken, that, that stock, mixed up in that rice. And give a cup. And have a soup line and give a cup. And minister Jesus Christ to people while you're feeding them. Come on, brother. I'm going to tell you something. The big buildings, those shepherds, are not preparing for their sheep. Or they're, and they're even not preparing for the end time harvest. That's right. But God said, you feed them. That means if you have something, he can multiply it. But if you have nothing, what can you give? Nothing for nothing leaves nothing. I heard a, I heard a, a, a Muslim got saved over a over a, a, a bowl of spaghetti no my brother a bowl of spaghetti a christian came into town and he came there to actually minister and some friends of this muslim Ask this uh, uh, that these these Muslims were Christian and a friend was coming in and they didn't have anything and I think it goes along the lines that they had asked a friend of theirs to could they uh, you know help feed this friend that was coming in no they didn't know he was a Christian a friend of theirs was coming in and they asked this other Muslim asked these other uh, Muslims if they could help feed him so they went to the other Muslims house. So, and when they went there, this Muslim's like, he don't even have enough food. All they had was a bowl of macaroni. I'm sorry, it was macaroni. And he said, we don't even have enough to eat ourselves. All we got is this one bowl. He said, well, we'll just do what we got to do. So the Christian man, he didn't know it was a Christian man, came in and sat down. So they gave the Christian man first, and they didn't know he was a Christian. And they served him. And then they took some, and the, you know, the husband and wife took some, and, and that was there. And they just began to talk and began to eat. Well, then, you know, there was stuff left over in the bowl. So they asked him if he wanted more. So they gave him more, and then they took some. And this man, this Muslim man, that was feeding this Christian, he said, all I know is I'm looking at a bowl of macaroni on the table, and while they're talking, this Christian man starts ministering the gospel, and it just so happens he's teaching about when God fed the 5,000. And while he's there, all he knows is the macaroni is multiplying in a bowl. So the, he got saved through, he knew that this man, his God, was the God of the macaroni. <laughs> <laughs> Yo! 
Yes, the, the, the God that multiplies food. And that's how that man got saved. And that's why he said, he told Peter, Peter said, all we have is this little boy, he's got five loaves and two fish. But they had something, but the command was given to Peter and the disciples, you feed them. You feed them. So if you guys, I mean, you can go to Sam's and get some buckets and buy 50 pounds of rice for $17. You know how much rice you can buy for $100? Well, let's just see, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So that's, that's five bags. That's 250 pounds of rice for $100. Do you know how much 250 pounds of rice is? Do you know how many people you could serve with 250 pounds of rice? Wow. You know how many souls you could save? You know how many souls you could save with 250 pounds of rice? Isn't it kind of sound kind of funny when Elisha went into the Shulamite woman's house, remember? And said, you know, uh, and Elijah as well. The oil multiplied. Make me a cake first. Remember that one? And bring, uh, uh, bring vessels, not a few. You know? And they just opened the oil up and began to fill and fill and fill. God can multiply what it is you have. But if you don't have anything... Well then, what can you do with nothing? And I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of people out there that are believing they don't have to put things away. But Jesus clearly warns that in the last days that there's going to be a great famine. And if you can't see it already happening in our world that we live in today, you know, uh, Arkansas, I mean, California's dried up, you know. Chickens. Yeah, 21 million chickens they just put to death. What? Yeah. 21 million chickens supposedly had the bird flu. Blue bells. Blue bells ice cream is deal. If you don't know, 80% of our food is imported. You hear what I said? Did you just hear what I told you? 80% of our food is imported. Why do you think they paid the farmers not to farm years ago? Why did God tell Joseph to store? Why did he tell Noah to prepare the ark and bring things in the ark? You're going to need a year's worth of food for the animals. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. They was in the ark a year and ten days. Proverbs 23, 23, Proverbs 27, Proverbs 23, and Proverbs 27. A wise man sees a thing far off and prepares himself, but the foolish go on to destruction. Do you know how many people are going to be killing each other in the streets for food? But guess what? We have foreknowledge through Jesus Christ to know what's coming because he's warned us. Foreknowledge means just to know before what happens. And the reason I'm putting food away, yes, yeah, so I can eat, but that ain't what's in my heart. I'm going to use it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the United States is going to become a, a third world country here shortly. And the big trucks ain't going to be running up and down the street any longer. And bringing your food to the stores where you go and buy your food. In fact, the Bible says that they're going to cast their silver and gold in the streets. It's going to be ate up like a canker worm. Can't do anything with it. In fact, they polluted the ozone so bad now that the aluminum that's raining down on us and our bodies, the reason we hurt and the things we go through is because the Food and Drug Administration has so polluted our food and the drugs.
you know, we're the biggest nation, we're the number one uh, country in the world for pharmacia, pharmaceuticals, where we get the word sorcery, and it's provided by our own government. You want to know why you're hurt? It's because of the food we eat. They're killing us. They're trying to kill us. But you know what? I don't care. Because I ain't going unless God says to go. The Bible says no weapon formed against us shall prosper. They don't understand that we have Jesus Christ coursing through our veins. And we ain't going to us. And the Bible says that there's going to be a great harvest in the end time. And we are not to be fearful. In fact, this is what he says. He says, um, he says, um, and there shall be great earthquakes in diverse places and famines and pestilence and fearful sights and great signs shall uh, be in, in the heaven. But before all of these, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to the synagogues. Wow, that means religious leaders. Do you know that the former president of Israel just went to uh, Pope Francis and said, we need to have peace. We need to form a one world religion. We want to form a one world religion. That was about three days ago. That was Benjamin? It wasn't Benjamin Netanyahu. No, it was a former president of Israel. And it says, um, he says, but before all these things, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues and into the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Wow. They're killing Christians all over the place. Why do they want to kill Christians? Because we're the one that has the truth. Wow. You want to know if you have the truth? Are they killing you? Why do they hate us? Because we represent Jesus Christ. And he says, And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Wow. That's that latter rain he's talking about. Them taking us and bringing us before the synagogues and these leaders and all that, God says, hey, this is going to turn as an opportunity, this is going to turn into an opportunity for you to testify for me. And he says, settle it therefore in your hearts. Settle this. Verse 14, settle it in your heart. This is going to happen. Don't worry about it. Amen. He says, not to meditate before what you're going to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all of your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren. Wow, brethren. Big word. That's fellow Christians. That's in verse 16. Luke 21, 16. And you shall be betrayed of kin, by kinfolks and friends. And some of you uh, they shall cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair on your head perish. In your patience, possess your souls. In your patience, possess your souls. You know what that means? You know what your soul is? Soul is your mind and your will and your emotions. So Jesus is saying, listen, I'm telling you in the last days that I know that your mind and your emotions are going to be running crazy because of the things that are going to be going on. But he tells us to possess it. Take it captive and hold on to it. Because listen, I've already told you what's coming. That's what he said. I'm telling you what's coming. You know that this is coming. So prepare it. We see it happening now. We're, we are a chosen generation. We've been chosen to live in the time that we're living in right now. Amen. To see one of the most awesomest things uh, we could, you know. That's right. The unfolding of the end times right before our eyes. And it's not going to be pretty. But you know what? We've been called for this time. That's right. You've been appointed for this time. And if he's called you, that means he's equipped you. And you know what's going to keep us through all of this? The latter rain. 
Amen. It's the outpour of the Holy Spirit that's going to be so unbelievably, unfathomably amazing. It's going to be greater than the former because this is the end of all things. There's going to be a great end time harvest. So establish it in your hearts. Prepare spiritually, prepare physically to do the work of the Lord because it's coming. Your opportunity for ministry is coming. It's only just starting. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, you amazing Father. Lord, I pray over this body, Lord, over your church, Lord, that it says you're coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. And that word spot that's described in Peter, Lord, has to do with the uh, that love and hunger for the world and uh, the, the wantingness of uh, greed and, and the lusts of the things of this world, Father. When all of that stuff is going to perish, Lord. Father, make us a church, prepare us a church prepared for the coming of the Lord with our lamps trimmed, Father. Lord, use this, Father, in the end to bring in harvest, to feed the hungry, Lord, physically and then spiritually, Father. In Jesus' name.